Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalam ala Rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah. And may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon our last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can everyone hear? Is the microphone working well? Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, as you heard, my name is brother James Yi, James Yusuf Yi. And uh, it's an honor, it's a pleasure. It's a blessing actually to be here today to try and raise more awareness on this topic of Guantanamo. January 11th, 2012, just a few days ago, actually marked the 10th shameful year that Guantanamo Bay has been in operation. This U.S. military prison camp where Muslims have been held since January 11th, 2002. So it's been 10 years. And I agree with our, our, our opening a statement from our brother that at this point in time the issue really today is not being talked about enough. It, in America especially it has seemed to have taken uh, a, a back burner, has been put to the rear in terms of the issues that are being discussed in public by our elected officials, by people in the United States. So I agree that this is an issue that we need to discuss more in order that one day Insha'Allah, this place will be closed down. But nevertheless, it's a pleasure to be here in Birmingham and in, Insha'Allah, some other cities throughout the UK to, to talk about my experience and to talk about uh, what we have gained from Guantanamo. But addressing that question, what have we gained from Guantanamo? Uh, we probably have gained a lot from Guantanamo, but not in a positive sense. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of my experience serving as the Muslim chaplain at Guantanamo back in 2002 and 2003 and how my life has changed because of serving at this prison camp and now also 10 years later how the lives of Muslims have changed uh, in the United States and perhaps elsewhere because of the September 11th attacks and also of Guantanamo Bay. But to give you a little bit more of my background uh, you heard I'm a former U.S. Army Muslim chaplain. Uh, prior to that, I served as a, an officer, an air defense artillery officer, even having served in the first Gulf War, the aftermath of the first Gulf War with a Patriot Missiles uh, Battalion. Uh, but I'm also a graduate of West Point, the prestigious United States Military Academy. And I now am from a family that has the military rooted uh, in, in, its, in its tradition, in its legacy. The Yi family uh, includes my younger brother, who is also a West Point graduate, includes my other brother, who has served as a U.S. Army doctor, and it includes my father, who is 85 years old this year, born in the United States, also served in the U.S. Army when he was drafted during World War II. So all of the men, all of the males in my family, have served in the U.S. military and in some sense, in some way, shape or form have contributed to this idea of national security uh, for the United States. Not only am I former military, but I'm also a former Christian. I was raised Christian, I was raised Lutheran, and I converted to Islam, as some might say, I reverted to Islam back in 1991. So that's my background. Military, Muslim convert, Muslim revert, however you might phrase it. And I'm also a third generation Chinese American. So it was my grandparents who immigrated from China, southern China, to the United States. My parents, as I mentioned, are US born citizens. Both of my brothers, both of my sisters, myself, also all born in the United States. That's my background. But it was in 2002, November, following the September 11th attacks that I was given the assignment to become the chaplain down at Guantanamo Bay. Right. And when I received this assignment, I was a rather new chaplain. I had just returned to active duty U.S. Army military service as a Muslim chaplain in January of 2001. Then the attacks in September, and then I received the orders in late or mid-2002 no, uh, mid to go down to Guantanamo. And I didn't know much about Guantanamo at that time, but I had read 
things in the media and felt that by going down to Guantanamo as the Muslim chaplain that I could fulfill a, an important role. Helping to educate US military soldiers, helping to educate some of the federal employees or even intelligence officers who were down in Guantanamo about Islam, about the Muslim culture. And this was an idea that I had that I could fulfill because I had read in the media stories like when the Muslims were first brought to Guantanamo when in Camp X-Ray where they were being held in a facility known as Camp X-Ray in these chain link type caged cells when they made their prayer they made sujood, made salah they took the towels that were afforded to the prisoners they fashioned them into a turban and put them on their heads guards would come and take the M16s and knock them right off right? I read in the media how some of the first physicians that were sent to Guantanamo to do the medical exams of prisoners brought to this military base were female, and female women doctors and because many of the Muslims in Guantanamo came from very conservative practicing Muslim societies refused to look at these women in the eye as many Muslims do out of modesty but how did these women these American women and physicians react they said these people in Guantanamo these Muslims they won't even look at me in the eye they feel they treat us and they treat they they react and respond to us as if we are some type of poison so you have this air they have this idea that Muslims are degrading women when they have no understanding of cultural practices within our faith right? so this was a something that I thought I could help change going to Guantanamo educating people down at this military base in this prison camp to perhaps uh, hope that this prison operation could be improved or could be uh, better when I got down to Guantanamo I was given more definitive role one was to be an advisor to the camp commander on religion religious practices myself being a Muslim chaplain advising the camp command on some of the re religious accommodations that could possibly be afforded to Muslim prisoners at Guantanamo but I was also in that role as a chaplain to the prisoners and in that role as a chaplain to the prisoners let, let me first describe what a chaplain does in the military in a normal unit soldiers who have issues with their chain of command with a sergeant with their first sergeant if they have issues with the chain of command that soldier if tries to address that issue with the chain of command that issue is not going to go anywhere so the chaplain in the US military is a second form of communication that a soldier can go to and bring that issue straight to the commander in order to get it addressed in a prison situation that role is very similar the chaplain is there to get some of those concerns complaints issues directly from the prisoners so they can be directly brought to the commander because if those prisoners have issues with guards and they try to address those issues with the guards in order to get the commander that issue is not going to go anywhere so I provided that channel of communication for prisoners and every day in these cell blocks of Camp Delta now these cell blocks made of stronger sturdy steel mesh still very much cage-like I would speak with prisoners in Guantanamo, hear the complaints and concerns. Okay. The question that we have here, what do we gain from Guantanamo? One of the things that has occurred in my view, from my experience, that I saw happening in Guantanamo was a reversal of values. American values, values of human rights, values of religious freedom. And in particular, during those early days in Guantanamo, I pinpointed many of my, my talks following my experience in Guantanamo on focusing on how religion in Guantanamo was used as a weapon. And because time is short, I'm just going to summarize maybe one incident or one story that I heard from prisoner, even verified by American translators who worked inside some of the interrogation rooms of Guantanamo where a prisoner merely described for me down in Guantanamo when I was there telling me how he was forced in an interrogation room shackled at the wrist at the waist the ankles in a circle which had a satanic symbol in it 
and that interrogator, that Ameri American interrogator attempted to force him to bow down, to make sujood in the center of this satanic circle, while that American translator would scream at him that Satan is your God now, not Allah. Right? Not Allah, the Almighty, Azzawajal, the creator of all things. Right? This was done to try and break that prisoner of his faith. Right? Mil military and federal intelligence operatives in Guantanamo understood very clearly our doctrine, our belief in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And so creating situations in interrogation rooms were specifically targeted at breaking the Muslim belief and faith of prisoners in Guantanamo in hopes that they can gain some type of intelligence or information. The mass majority of any, uh, anyone in Guantanamo probably had little to no valuable information. And I make this statement often that in Guantanamo, when I was there in late 2002, most of 2003, there wasn't one single prisoner in Guantanamo that could be definitively connected in any which way to terrorism of 9-11. It just was not a reality. Not one prisoner. I was there, there were 680 or so prisoners in this prison camp. Not one could be connected to terrorism. The 9-11 attacks. And I say that, why? Because if the United States, if my government, if the United States military, the military that I was serving, had actually captured a legitimate terrorist, they were not brought in those early days to Guantanamo when I was there. Where were they brought? Where were they put? In a secret CIA black site. So during my time when these 680 or so Muslims were in Guantanamo, I would say that not one of them could any way be considered a terrorist. Right? But that was the reality of my experience in Guantanamo. And when I heard some of these stories from prisoners, when I understood what was going on in some of these interrogation rooms, Muslims being persecuted for their faith, I saw Muslims being dragged through the gravel of Guantanamo, being taken to these interrogation sessions, being treated like dogs. Right? I raised concerns to my chain of command in the detention side of the operation. Input which I actually believe my chain of command valued because I myself would receive a re rewards, official military awards in Guantanamo during my service, during my time there. Right. I received also, after 10 months in Guantanamo, an opportunity to go home, come back to the United States, see my family, right. knowing that after a week or two I would have to go back to Guantanamo and finish the last two years or last two months of what would be for me a full year of military service, military duty in Guantanamo. But when I came back in the United States, after having raised objections to some of the way, to the mistreatment of prisoners in Guantanamo, I was then arrested in my own country, swarmed by immigration officers, customs officials, army counterintelligence, naval criminal investigators, NCIS. FBI, two agents, I would be arrested once I came back on U.S. soil and I was locked away in, a, in solitary confinement for 76 days in a naval brig, in a naval prison where the president at that time, George Bush, was holding what he termed U.S. citizen enemy combatants. Individuals by the names of Yasser Hamdi, uh, Saleh Hadmari, Jose Padilla, were being held in the same prison where I was transported to in Charleston, South Carolina. And when I was transported to this prison, I was shackled in the same way that prisoners in Guantanamo were shackled, in that suit of chains. I was also subjected to sensory deprivation. You've seen the photos of prisoners in Guantanamo having the blackened out goggles over their eyes and the devices over the ears, preventing, preventing them from hearing or seeing. I was subjected to that when I was transported to this maximum security naval brig in Charleston, South Carolina, after I was arrested. And it was only after two weeks when my family learned of where I was when they saw me on the news. When the headline, two weeks later, 
hit the news that the Muslim chaplain at Guantanamo had been arrested and was now being held in this prison. That's how my family learned of where I was. I never came home that day. I was supposed to. It was like I had disappeared in America. In the end, though, as my entire life was investigated by probably every intelligence agency in America, all the charges, all the accusations that were brought against me, accusations that included spying, espionage, aiding the enemy, mutiny and sedition, all four of which are capital crimes that you can be put to death for. And indeed, I was actually threatened with the death penalty by military prosecutors in the early days of my arrest. Right. All of those accusations would disappear. They would be dropped. I would be released from prison. No case would ever go to trial. I was reinstated as a chaplain, after which I tendered my resignation and even received an honorable discharge. And when I separated from the military, I even received a second U.S. Army Commendation Medal. But my life was turned upside down. What have I gained from Guantanamo Bay? My life has changed. My life was investigated from top to bottom. My financial records, my private business affairs were all probed into by new policies in the United States, like something called the Patriot Act, which allows for the US government merely to give what they call a national security letter to some bank to some financial institution, to some business, to get into your personal records. Right. My life was investigated upside down. Right. And I learned that my life, my financial records, were probed by a national security letter by the US military in an article from the New York Times. I'm under scrutiny all the time. I suspect that my emails, my phone calls, are all monitored. For the very first years after my experience in Guantanamo, I was routinely put under severe security inspections just to get on a plane to fly within the United States. And any time I leave the United States and come back into the country, there is a transportation security agent, a TSA agent, waiting at the door of the plane to escort me directly to immigration and to be questioned and interrogated once again. And I know that's going to happen when I return to the US on February 10th, when I, when, I, when I leave the UK on this trip. It happened when I went to Kuala Lumpur last year. It happened when I went to Mumbai the year before. It happened on my other trips to the UK in, in, in the past. All right, so that's what I've gained, always under this constant scrutiny. And it's not only me, it's many people in the United States. There's a current story, there's a current, current news in the United States Specifically in New York, where the 9-11 attacks took place. A recent, in recent weeks, the Associated Press has disclosed, has revealed, that the New York Police Department has, with the help of the CIA, has put Muslims within a hundred mile radius of New York City under surveillance. And that they are monitoring mosques. They are monitoring Islamic centers, Islamic schools, even restaurants where Muslims might go and eat, even beauty salons where Muslims might go and get their hair done, even what we call in America hookah lounges where some Muslims might go and smoke this argila or this, uh, this, this shisha, right? <laughs> Anywhere where Muslims might congregate, a bookstore, are all under surveillance by the New York Police Department with the help of the CIA. The Muslim student associations in New York City are under surveillance. MSA, your counterpart to ISOC, are under surveillance. Right? We're profiled in America. This is how lives have changed. Policies within our federal agencies have become much more Islamophobic, has become much more anti-Islam. Just in the past year, it was revealed by this website, Wired.com. They exposed some of the training slides that our FBI in America uses to train federal agents on Islam. And in these slides, it characterized the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as being a, quote, cult leader. They informed agents that Muhammad 
peace be upon him, was someone who assassinated his critics, that employed torture. Right? When they defined hadith, they said hadith is a, quote, technical manual for jihad. Right? When they defined zakat to these federal agents, these FBI trainers said that zakat, the religious obligation for Muslims to give charity, is, quote, the funding mechanism, or a funding mechanism for combat, and combat service, and combat service support. So these are the ideas that are being perpetrated to even federal agents who are, who, who are charged with investigating crimes, even crimes of terrorism. But this is the information that is going into their head, giving them this broad impression that any Muslim could be suspect or a terrorist. When these FBI slides compared Islam to other religions, they had a chart. They said Catholicism. If you follow the path of, of this faith, you go towards a nonviolent track. Judaism. If you follow the Torah, you go towards a nonviolent track. Even if you're what they call a realist, someone who has no religion, you are passive. But when they put Islam up, they said, you are anyone who follows Islam and the Quran, you go towards this violent track, and you are offensive and aggressive. And if you are more pious and more religious, the chart showed that you become more violent. Right? So this is the idea that even the US federal agencies are getting. Muslim communities in America were outraged when we saw these uh, these, these training slides and many Muslim organizations began engaging FBI special agents throughout the United States demanding accountability of why agents are being trained in this matter. Right? So this is how things have changed in America. And it seems to be much worse even 10 years following September 11th. Polls and surveys in America seem to suggest that Islamophobia has gained much more traction, even after the first few days. In America, we have states, local communities, local government officials, submitting legislations to ban Sharia law in America. To ban Sharia law under the US Constitution and form of government that we have in the United States, it's impossible that Sharia law actually can be implemented in this democratic process. But yet, there are people who are submitting this legislation that suggests that Sharia law should be banned. Right? So Muslims are saying, why would you want to ban Sharia law? Doesn't Sharia teach you to respect your mother? Since there's a tradition that says that Jannah taqta laqdam al ummaha, right? That Jannah, that paradise is at the foot of our mothers. Doesn't that teach us to respect our mothers? Why would we want to ban something like that? Right? So this is our response in America when we see elected officials trying to legislate a banning of Sharia. And we've seen it in other countries. The banning of minarets, right? In, in, in what country? Uh, in Switzerland, right? The banning of hijab in France and whatnot. Right? In America, they're also trying to go forth in some of these measures. Just a year or two ago, there was a huge controversy in New York City about an organization that wanted to build a, a, a cultural center with a musallah and a, a mosque in it, close to the area of the ground zero, right? Caused huge controversy. The public was out there in droves protesting against the building of this mosque. Right? But that's not just happening in New York City, it's happening all over America. On CNN, there, last year there was a, a documentary that was profiled by the esteemed journalist in America, Soledad O'Brien, right? She profiled this, this and you can see it on YouTube, it's called uh, Unwelcome, the Muslims Next Door, an hour-long documentary that CNN did profiling this community in the state of Tennessee, who outgrew its Islamic center, bought a tract of land to build a new mosque. The people protested. And first it was just demonstrations, but then it turned to vandalism. The new sign that said the new Islamic center to be built was spray-painted. Next it was sawed in half. Right? Then it turned to more violent crimes. Because when the construction equipment rolled onto the site to build, start building this Islamic center, 
One night someone would go and then torch and put on fire this construction equipment in order to try and prevent this Islamic Center being built. This is happening all over America. In America, you don't see the churches overflowing with congregants. You don't see the Jewish temples and synagogues overflowing with congregants. They're actually being sold off, many of them, to the Muslim community. It's the Muslim community that is growing and mosques that are going up everywhere in the United States. But there's resistance from non-Muslims protesting against Muslims developing and engaging and becoming part of the greater society. So we see this Islamophobia taking place. Even in the current presidential election of 2012, those candidates who will be running against President Barack Obama seem to fall to this litmus test of being a candidate for the Republican Party in the United States that in order to do so you have to bash Muslims. You know, Michelle Bachman, who was a candidate recently before dropping out of the race, had said some very negative things about a sitting Muslim congressman, Keith Ellison, who was the first Muslim elected to the U.S. Congress in 2006. Right? Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania, who is currently a, a candidate, said that the first people that you would profile in America would be Muslims. Right? Newt Gingrich is also a possible candidate to be the primary uh, uh, candidate for the Republican Party recently said that he would n never support a Muslim running for president unless that individual publicly uh, denounced Sharia. Right? So these are the types of things. Mitt Romney, I believe, in, in a past election said, said some negative, negative things, Islam, I think, on the, on, the, on the level of that he would never, uh, maybe it was John McCain who said that he would never have a Muslim in his cabinet. Right? But I recall Mitt Romney also saying something very negative, and I found that very strange because Mitt Romney, who's running for the presidency also, himself comes from a religious minority. He's a Mormon. Right? So we see Islamic, Islamophobia, the rhetoric, the hate crimes, resistance to mosques, and policies being implemented. Most recently, at the national level, we see policies being enacted by the U.S. government. Barack Obama himself recently signing into legislation the National Defense Authorization Act, which now legislates to the President of the United States the power to hold someone indefinitely without charge by the U.S. military, and that would even include a U.S. citizen taken into custody outside U.S. borders. Right? Before, that was all done under George Bush without any authority. And the courts over time, over the last decade, have continued to denounce some of these things that the Bush administration had done. At the highest levels of the Supreme Court, denouncing that, no, it would be unconstitutional for you to do that. But now the U.S. Congress has legislated some of these things. And the only hope now is that when these laws are challenged by the U.S. Supreme Court, that they will also be struck down. Right? And then there are also further actions that the U.S. government have taken following Guantanamo and 9-11, like the targeted assassinations of U.S. citizens based on rhetoric, even extremist rhetoric, but no evidence of, any, of individuals even having committed crimes, but just merely mouthing some extremist words. The U.S. government has engaged U.S. citizens and have assassinated U.S. citizens with drones, unmanned drones, without due process. When really the civil action, the civil response, should be to go and capture those individuals, put them in a court of law, and if a jury decides that they've committed a crime, then they can be convicted and punished. Right? But instead, the U.S. government has gone further and has taken actions that may even be more extreme than what was done by previous administrations. I criticize a lot of the things that are going on in the current Obama administration because in 2008 I was very hopeful that when, President, uh, when Barack Obama was running for president and he promised to close Guantanamo, he promised to, to ban torture without exception, he promised to rid Guantanamo from these military commissions, I was very hopeful that as a constitutional law expert from Harvard University or should I say Harvard University, right? 
could do this and resolve these issues. Right? To the extent that I myself got thoroughly engaged in the American political process and actually became a national delegate for Obama, pledged to this man so that he can be the primary candidate for the Democratic Party to become president. And was very hopeful that when he did win this election and did two days later sign that executive order to close Guantanamo, I thought that my participation in this system was a good thing. But as I've seen the president, who I heavily supported, backtrack and done an about face, in some ways even my faith in political leaders has changed, has weakened. You know, and I believe many people in America who believe that Guantanamo should be closed and believe in the promises that Barack Obama made also feel betrayed and feel as if the system does not uphold itself as what it should be. Right? So this, in my view, is what we have gained from Guantanamo. But where do we go from here? What should we be doing? For starters, I believe a program like this to raise further awareness of, of issues and to get together as a community, our community, to brainstorm, to come up with ideas, to contemplate, to strategize on what we can do to make a difference is, is a great first start. I want to stop here. I think I've probably gone over my 20 minutes, but I want to leave ample time for Brother Moazam Beg to give his comments uh, on Guantanamo and these issues as well. But again, uh, I'm very happy to be here with all of you, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible following the program. My name, as you heard, James Yusuf Yee, the former U.S. Army Muslim chaplain at Guantanamo Bay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته again great pleasure to be able to address um, a young audience of people who uh, perhaps forming your ideas still still trying to recognize what's happening in this world and are looking to the issues of Guantanamo Bay to help to form some of those ideas it's been ten years as brother Yusuf has just explained, um, since that place was opened, or since at least prisoners were first taken there, and many of you would have been young children at the time when those images of those men kneeling in orange suits, wearing the face masks and the blackened out goggles and the earmuffs, had hit the world's media. They were made to look like extraterrestrial beings from a B movie, a sci-fi movie, because it was said of us that we are animals, that we are subhuman, that we are the worst of the worst. That's how we were portrayed, and that's how we were treated. That's why the terminology to use to describe us included things like enemy combatant, enemy belligerent, and enemy alien. When you use the word alien to describe another human being, it means that he doesn't fit. And it's true, we didn't fit. But of course, as Muslims, we know we don't fit. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, بَدَى الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأَ فَطُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَاءَ The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which is well known, that Islam began as a stranger and it will return as a stranger as it began. So glad tidings to the strangers. Indeed, the Muslims of Guantanamo Bay were the strangest of people there for no reason other than the fact that the United States had unleashed its war on terror, Operation Enduring Freedom, or rather I should say Operation Ending Your Freedom, whereby people were taken across the Atlantic, to the Americas by the Americans, in shackles, to strange lands. And the last time, of course, that had happened, if you read the history of the black Americans, about the Afri African Americans, you'll see that they too were taken across 
the Atlantic in shackles. And that a great number of them were Muslims. And if you read the history of those Muslims, and I refer, to you, I refer you to a book called Servants of Allah. Servants of Allah. If you read this book, you'll see how these slaves during that period held on to their faith in a way that's almost unimaginable. Little is left now of those people except those who came back to Islam uh, after the works of people like Haj, uh, Malik Shabazz and uh, Malcolm X and others. But by the time the beginning of the last century had begun, Islam had been forced out of them. They'd been forced to become Christians. But you see how hard they tried to hold on to their faith. You'll find, for example, that the most educated of the quote-unquote slaves were the Muslims because of their memorization of the Quran and the Hadith and writing and that sometimes they would be more educated than their slave master who couldn't write. So then when he asked his slave to write for him the stock that he had in his household, he would do so in Arabic. And these are the types of traditions that the Muslims would continue to hold on to. And if you see this book, you'll find that all the way from Tawheed to Hajj, they held on to the pillars of Islam with their molar teeth until their teeth were broken. And such is the legacy of Guantanamo. For as Brother Yusuf painted a very dark picture of how the United States has changed, particularly for Muslims, I also want to tell you what we have actually gained. What have we gained? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his noble book, Am hasibtum an tadkhulul jannah walamma yatikum mathalul ladhina khalaw min qablikum ma'asatumul ba'sa'u wa darra'u wa zulzilu hatta yaqulul rasul wal ladhina amanu ma'a mata nasrullah ala inna nasrullahi qareeb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something that should be uh, a reminder for every single one of us regarding our purpose, regarding tests, and regarding what is to come in the future. Do you think that you enter paradise and the example of those who went before you will not be laid upon you too? They were tested with hardship and heart harshness and difficulties until the very earth underneath their feet shook like an earthquake and the Prophet and those who believed with him not ordinary people the Prophet and the believers with him said when will the help of Allah come and the response is a very simple one but one in which we must have certainty I remember the first day I was taken into US custody into Kandahar prison there's a brother from Kuwait Faiz al Qandari, who's, Qandari, who's still there, he walked in shackles and chains past my cell. And we were all subdued. We'd been beaten and tortured. Our beards had been shaved off forcibly. Our hair had been shaved off. We'd been kicked and punched. We'd seen the Quran torn into pieces and thrown into a toilet, into a bucket. We had to share a bucket between us for to, for to, to use as a toilet. And they threw the ripped pages of the Quran into this. And brothers were kicked and punched and dragged on the floor. Dogs were brought over their naked bodies to salivate and to growl and, and to uh, scratch them with their paws. And they were taking photographs and they were pointing guns at us. Around in the uh, chamber. And they were trying to terrify us. The war on terror became a war of terror. But this brother, he went past and he said, Al Farj Qareeb, Al Farj Qareeb, that deliverance is near. He's still there 10 years later. And I know from everything I've learned of him, he still maintains Al Farj Qareeb. Take the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. Yusuf. What did he say? Rabbi, when they threw him into the prison. In fact, take a look at this story. Subhanallah. If it wasn't for the story of Yusuf, which is the only story in the Quran, the only chapter in the Quran that begins 
and ends as a complete and entire story, a narration. And if it wasn't for this story, the story of detention without trial, of false imprisonment for a crime you've not committed, neither would Judaism, Christianity, or Islam be complete. Incomplete religions without the story of imprisonment without trial or imprisonment falsely. But what was his response? Rabbi, asijnu ahabu ilayya mimma yad'unani ilay. Oh my Lord, prison is more beloved to me than that which they call me to. And what happens later on in the story? If it wasn't for the fact that he was imprisoned, would we even know about Yusuf alayhi salam's story? How could the dream that he saw, in which he said that he saw the moon and the sun and the stars bowing down to him, how could that have been interpreted had he not been taken to prison? He had to go to prison for us to take note of his story today. All of us, all the great Abrahamic faiths, agree with this. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He stayed in prison just for a few years. It's almost said in a passing by statement. A few years. And what is a few years in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When the greatest uh, scholar, Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, مَاذَا يَسْنَعُ عَدَائِ بِي فَجَنَّتِ وَبُسْتَانِ فِي صَدْرِ أَيْنَ مَا رَحْتُ لَا تُفَارِقُنِي فَحَبْسِ خَلْوَ وَقَتْلِ شَهَادَ وَإِخْرَاجِ مِنْ بِلَادِي سِيَاحَ What can my enemies do of me? For my paradise and my garden are in my heart, in my chest. Wherever I go, they do not leave me. Killing me is martyrdom. Uh, sorry, for throwing me in prison is time in meditation, in solitude, in seclusion with my Lord. Killing me is martyrdom, and throwing me out of my land is tourism. Not terrorism, tourism. And so these terrorists that you see in Guantanamo Bay, as we were told, as the world said that these are the world's most dangerous men, the worst of the worst. Ironically, more than 600 of the worst of the worst have been released. And out of those people who've been released, there are people from every corner of the world. There are people in Guantanamo who speak Pashto and Farsi and Turkish and Uyghur, Chinese, Arabic, uh, Urdu, Swahili, English, Belgian, Flemish, French. But you know the lingua franca of Guantanamo, it isn't English like it is here. Everybody in Guantanamo, every prisoner rather in Guantanamo, doesn't speak English, though some have learnt it. The lingua franca of Guantanamo's prisoners is Arabic. So the person that goes there, wherever he's from, even if he doesn't speak a word of the language, comes out speaking it very, very well. But not only that, that's just one thing, because Arabic language in itself, it can be good and it can be bad. The Prophet ﷺ was an Arab, but then so was Abu Jahl. They both spoke Arabic. So that in itself is not the goal. The goal is to be able to converse and understand the language of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what it is that he's asked us to do. And that's not lost on those prisoners, because amongst them, those prisoners who uh, Brother Yusuf didn't mention this point, but he was the first person there to bring books of any worth to the Muslim prisoners there. Books of seerah and fiqh and hadith and tafsir, books the likes of which you would not have found. And unless somebody who understood Islam and these prisoners would not have been there. But after he was removed from there, the books went with him. Because they didn't want any seditious ideas meaning Islam, spreading too far. Nonetheless, remember that the Qur'an was never taught by pen. It was taught into the hearts of men ever before it was written into a book. It was because it penetrated the hearts of men that they wrote it into a book because when the hearts were filled with wanting to defend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion, 
the people were running off to the battle of Yamama against the Musaylm al-Kadhab, the liar. And they were all getting killed. Everybody who'd memorized the Quran was getting killed. So the Sahaba said, we better put this down into a book form, lest we lose them all and the whole book of Allah with it. So they acted. They were people of action and belief, not simply people of tongue. But what happened? Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is a Nabi al-Ummi, the unlettered Prophet. And so when they used to come to ourselves and rip the Quran up or to write uh, profanities within it or to simply kick it onto the floor to test our patience or to see what effect it has on us, some of the prisoners would say, if this is what you're going to do to the Quran, the Quran, which is the only thing that is familiar to me, they took away my freedom, they took away my atmosphere, my, f my, f uh, my family, my food, my clothing, everything is strange to me. The only thing that I see is familiar to me is the Quran because whether I'm from China or whether I'm from Pakistan or from Bangladesh or from Tunisia, it's the same. But when you damage this Quran in order to get at me, then I say, take the Quran away. I will learn the Quran the way of the unlettered prophet. And so the brothers, they taught each other in this way and continue to do that, continue to do that and taught each other many other things. Those who studied <coughs> whatever, is that, whatever it is that they studied, they weren't given like convicted prisoners in any normal prison. Uh, the ability to study a master's or a doctorate or a bachelor's or anything. It's not even a simple O-level or a GCSE. So they taught each other whatever they knew. And that's how many people learned so much in Guantanamo. It became... Uh, a university Madrasat Yusuf alayhi salam it's from the Madaris Yusuf alayhi salam but also it would not be right to mention all of these things and for you to think that the prisoners there mashallah have got fantastic iman are very strong and you know they're, they're almost unbelievable they had to go through some exceedingly difficult tests and let me give you just a flavor of the types of people who have been there. We've had children in Guantanamo. Some very high profile cases. One of the most well known is that of Omar Khadr, who was brought into the Bagram detention facility, which is where I was held first, uh, with a huge um, wound in, in, in his um, shoulder and in his chest. All pieces of flesh just come out after they'd shot him and um, uh, Ordnance had exploded around him. They shot his eye out, and he was just 14 years old at the time. He's still in Guantanamo. He's now 24 years old. His entire adolescent years have been passed in Guantanamo. He's grown um, into a man. There's another boy, Yusuf again, or, or Muhammad al Gharrani, from Chad. Put your hand up if you've ever heard of Chad. He's from Chad, very poor country. And he was, Guantanamo was one of the youngest in Guantanamo, again, 14 years old when he was taken to Guantanamo. They alleged that whatever it he was supposed to be part of, um, he was doing several years before that, two, three years before that, which would have made him 11 at the time of whatever it is they're accusing of being part of Al-Qaeda network in, uh, in the UK, which is unbelievable. He was released a couple of years ago, and alhamdulillah, his entire years of adolescence were uh, spent in Guantanamo. Another boy, Muhammad Jawad, from Afghanistan, is purported to be 12 years old when he was taken to Guantanamo. I remember there was this young boy called Shams in the Bagram <laughs> detention facility before we were all sent to Guantanamo. He'd been shot in his hip. The reason why is because the Americans had descended upon to his house and they had killed several people in the household and were taking away one of the members. And he tried to run and grab his relative. And he wouldn't let go, so they shot him. And he couldn't walk. And for months and months he couldn't walk. And we were not allowed to get up and walk in Bagram. We were not allowed to walk. It was a crime to walk without permission. So I was able to, uh, with permission, have this young boy throw his arm around my shoulders and walk around with him, help him to relearn how to walk. And that was, our, that was my ability to walk with him. 
All of these people went to Guantanamo and grew up there. You have people whose legs and arms were amputated in Guantanamo. There's one British prisoner here in London whose arm was amputated right from here in Guantanamo. You have people who are double amputees in Guantanamo. There's one I recently went to go and visit in Slovakia. He's an Egyptian. And I want to tell you a story and, and end with this, inshallah, because I don't want to end on a bad note. I want to end on a very powerful note. This brother I went to see is Egyptian. And his leg was also amputated in Guantanamo. I didn't know this at the time when I went to meet him. He was sent to Slovakia, where he's never been before, has got nothing to do with that country, because the Americans recognized that if they sent him or returned him back to Egypt, even by their standards, he's going to get tortured. So ironically, they didn't send him to Egypt because of his fear for torture. And there are many prisoners like that in Guantanamo, many prisoners, around 90 or so, who've been cleared for release even by the Americans. But many of them can't go back to their countries of origin, like, for example, China and others, Syria, uh, and some Palestinians, for example, Algerians, and so forth, because of the brutal repression that's taking place in their countries. So this brother, Adil al-Jazzar, the Egyptian, I went to go and visit him in Slovakia, which is a country that had accepted him uh, temporarily. And I'd taken some gifts from brothers over here, and I, my, my hands were full with all of these gifts. And when I went to meet him, uh, he didn't help me with these things. I thought, why is he not helping me? I'm struggling here. And he's walking along. We got onto the train and got uh, up, up to um, his little flat and got in there and sat down and made a little time for prayer, and we prayed together. Then I realized, when I stood next to him, as he, we went into uh, the shahud and sat down together, I realized his leg is harder than any leg that I felt before. And that in fact it's a prosthetic leg, it's a false leg. And after we finished the prayer, you know how sometimes you take your shoes off when you're tired, he took his leg off. That's how I realized. But he never said, he never complained. Most of these prisoners you'll find that they have been through a hardships. They will stand up for their rights. But in the end, they know the real person, the real one to complain to is Allah. That's it. But Adil, and this is what I want to finish with. Some people, they ask me this question often. Did the Americans ever let you pray? And I laugh. Oh, let me pray. I said, let me describe to you my first prayer in U.S. custody. Let me describe it to you. Hands shackled behind the back, seated on the floor of a C-130 US uh, military transport plane. Legs shackled and a strap across my, uh, my lap. Uh, the sounds of the engine, really loud. Soldiers shouting and screaming. Photographs that you can tell, despite the hood over my head, because of the flashes that are taking place. And on my left-hand side, somebody sitting there in a similar position. I can't see him, but I can sense him. He said, Salaam Alaikum. I said, Wa Alaikum Salaam. Kif Halak, Akhi. Alhamdulillah, Nabi Khair. Then he says, Akhi, Ana Adun, and the Salah, what the Salah Dakhal. He said, I think that the time for prayer has come. It's Maghrib time. Salat al Maghrib. And I'm thinking, Subhanallah. You know, I'd forgotten. After all these guys had put me through, I wasn't really thinking about Salah, to be honest. And look at this man. He reminds me. He reminds me of the prayer. <laughs> at a time when you could have been forgiven for forgetting. And he began and he started reciting the prayer. Because he was on the left. I said, Akhi, anta al-imam, anta al-yusar. You're on the left. You're the Imam. And that's how I, and, and we performed our first prayer in US military custody. So when people ask you, did the Americans ever let you pray? I laugh. Because I say the only one who could ever stop me from praying is me. And so this brother, this same Libyan brother, a couple of, few months ago, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I had the opportunity to go to Libya a couple of times. And who do I meet? I meet somebody who walks in to the room, armed to his teeth, his bullet vest across his chest, 
Kalashnikov slung over his shoulder, long hair, long beard, walks in with a group of other people. Salam alaikum wa alaikum salam. Start talking. He, I know he's a Guantanamo prisoner, but I don't know if I've ever met him before. I don't recognize him. And then we got talking, and then he says, we recognize that this was the man who was sitting next to me. He's free now. He was freed. Um, and then when the revolution began against Qaddafi, he, was well, he became one of the leaders. Not only that, Adil al-Jazar, the one who had been who'd lost his leg in, in Guantanamo, who was learning to reconnect with his wife and his four children through Skype, because he hadn't seen them for the past decade. He went back to Egypt, but he was arrested <coughs> upon entry and thrown into a military prison. But then the revolution came. Al-Muqallib al-Qulub. When we say, Allahumma al-Muqallib al-Qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. We say, oh Allah, the one who turns the hearts, make our, make our hearts steadfast on your religion. Al-Muqallib al-Qulub, qallab al-Dunya. The person, the one who turns the hearts, turned the world. And all of these despotic dictators who were backed by America, Britain and France and everyone else, lost their seats. Some went to prison, some got killed in very disgusting ways, and some had to run off to countries that are still waiting, like Saudi Arabia. And who came to power in these places? Why were there so many Tunisians, Egyptians, Syrians, Lebanese, Palestinians, Libyans, Moroccans in Guantanamo to begin with? Why were they there? Answer is because they were fighting against their regimes. That's why they were there to begin with. They weren't fighting against America. America, even if they hated America, is at the back of the queue. They wanted to bring about change in their countries. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed how it began in Tunisia. And subhanAllah, in Tunisia, all the Guantanamo brothers who were released and sent to other countries, fear, fearing that they couldn't return, have now begun to go back. People who had... 40, 50, 60 years sentences on their head are now free. Some of them are running the country. In Libya, two of the people who were handed over by British intelligence when they were living in uh, Hong Kong and, and uh, Thailand, they were handed over to Gaddafi as a gift. Those same people when the revolution began and some got out of prison, led the revolution to victory. Ironically, with British and American support. So here what you see is the rank hypocrisy of our government, of the United States government, and every other Western nation that we can see thus far. And it's really important we recognize this because all of this is part of the legacy. In the end, what we see with some of the victories taking place in North Africa, is that this is precisely what they wanted to stop. Look in Egypt. The Salafi party takes 20% of the vote. Muslim Brotherhood takes 60% of the vote. Even the Al-Wafd, which is a moderate Islamic party, takes 10%. What's the common factor? Everybody wants Islam. In Tunisia, when they still have people half naked, who can walk around on naked be nude beaches, alcohol available in the streets, the most liberal of all the places of the Arab world, who comes into party, into power? An Nahda party, the Islamic party. What does this tell you? Islam's coming. It's on the rise. And in the West, they didn't want to know. They said, they're all terrorists. They're all plotting to destroy our way of life. So people woke up, and the change came. And part of the legacy, part of the legacy of Guantanamo is these prisoners who've come back to become part of the change in their country. Even though the pagans detest it. So my dear brothers and sisters, I, I want to finish on that note to remember that your brothers in Guantanamo and elsewhere have indeed passed 10 years of all sorts of um, humiliation and torture and elsewhere and, and other things. 
but they've stood firm. And finally, just the last thing I have to say, there are some soldiers who came to Guantanamo who'd never seen a Muslim or met a Muslim. And the first time they ever heard the Adhan was in Cuba, in Guantanamo, as done, as recited or by the prisoners, in the same way as they heard the recitation of the Qur'an. And some of them told me quite clearly that it melted their hearts. And one in particular, there are two people that I know of for sure who accepted Islam there from the soldiers. But there are many more because that was, ni that was seven years ago that I know. And one of them I want to just finish off with this story of this sister. She's a friend on Facebook. Yeah, I am young enough to be on Facebook. <laughs> and she says, Brother, I'd like to, you to send this message to the brothers who are still in Guantanamo if you can. Tell them that I was a practicing Christian, I was a Catholic, but whenever I had any difficulties in life, I didn't turn to my faith. I turned to men, I turned to alcohol, I turned to depression and all sorts of things like that. But when I came to Guantanamo, I saw a new breed of people I've never seen before in my life. For as Yusuf said, these people treated me with the kind of respect I've never seen in the military. It's famous in the US military, well documented the types of abuse that is carried out against female soldiers, sexual abuse and others. Rape is commonplace. She said, I came across a people here who would talk to me with the type of dignity I didn't even know existed. And I saw that amongst them, that the weak who was amongst them was made strong by the group. And they would never leave a person abandoned, even though they were in the harshest of circumstance. So she said, when I came back to the United States after serving my tour, I started learning more about this religion. And then, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I recognized that this is the path to my salvation. And I said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad rasulullah. And she said, please tell those brothers that the seed of Islam in my heart was planted and it grew to its full fruition when I came back to the United States of America. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Jazakallahu khair. The question was, uh, he's, uh, the brother said he's heard condi uh, that conditions in Guantanamo have improved. Uh, is it such a big issue now? Really, the issue has never been about the conditions as much as has it been about the fact that people are held without charge or trial by the country that claims to be the biggest protector of freedom and human rights in the world. The fact that it's been 10 years, that 171 prisoners are still there, the fact that some of, as I said, children have grown into men in Guantanamo. Uh, conditions, let's say it like this, Malcolm X, he said, you don't take a knife, put it in a man's back nine inches deep, pull it back four inches and say we made progress. That's what's happened in Guantanamo. If progress is, if things have changed in Guantanamo, they never recognize that the knife was in the back to begin with. And so, you'll see that um, food has improved. Uh, some religious matters have improved. The abuses in terms of the, uh, the Quran and stuff being ripped is no longer taking place. But is that the standard? What the reality is, is that the prisoners still have to fight for some of their rights. Uh, and they're often on hunger strike. And the hunger strike is broken by this method. What they do is that they shackle a person's legs, shackle a person's hands, and then shackle his head or his neck. And then they get a tube uh, with a hard end at the top, and they push it into the nostril and force it into the stomach and pump in liquid food in order to keep force that person uh, to be nourished. So they use all kinds of methods to break the hunger strikes and, and the other types of resistance that the prisoners put up. Uh, in reality, though, uh, it, it would be unfair, and we are required by our Lord to be fair and to be just, even to our enemy, uh, or those who regard us as enemy. Uh, and some conditions, of course, have, ch have changed and have improved. But the greatest condition 
how could one replace a father who's never seen his child and a child who's never seen his father because he was born when his father was taken to Guantanamo? How do you better that condition? I've yet to find anybody who can tell me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I don't need one, uh, it okay. uh, is actually appropriate to put our trust in uh, the leaders that have hold of the uh, Guantanamo Bay, as Allah never tells us to trust them to follow the beginning. Uh, you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> brother's question is that is it okay? The brother's question is that you know should we put our trust in leaders? Um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not told us not to put uh, trust in the leaders who are kuffar anyway. Uh, I think there's a reality we have to deal with. Yes, they're kuffar, there's no doubt. But the reality is that the leader of the United States of America, even though he's a non-Muslim, or there's some dispute about that, isn't there? <laughs> Barack Hussein Obama. Okay, let's, he's not a Muslim, uh, but the issue is not about that. Because there's plenty so-called Muslim leaders who have done much worse and you know, whether they're Muslims or not is a different matter. The issue that we're appealing to in this, in this regard here, because the brothers held in Guantanamo elsewhere are held by them, and they make the decision of who's released and who isn't. So we can only hold them to their word. The alternative is this. What's the alternative? Nothing. The alternative is to simply say, they're all kuffar, their leaders are kuffar, we don't care about them, we won't engage in the process, okay, fine. Bring forth your army of liberation. Bring forth Khalid bin Walid and Salah al-Din to liberate them. That's not going to happen either. In the end, what happens is your brothers will remain in Guantanamo as they have for 10 years. And Guantanamo, let me just tell you, is the tip of the iceberg. There are secret prisons around that some of I've been through, some of the other brothers have been through, that make Guantanamo look like a holiday camp. And Guantanamo was a place where I was held in solitary confinement in a tiny cell that measures three foot by six foot with no window, no access to any other human being. And I say that despite that. So I think it's just important to bear that in mind, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. I like the question. It's a good question and it makes you think. But when you asked, should you trust these leaders uh, who are not Muslim? My first response would, first of all, you would never trust them with your faith or your deen because they're not Muslim. So when the, you ask about the trust, no. Your religion, your faith, no. We're not going to trust them at all with regard to that. With regard to their ability to rule a nation or rule a country or your local vicinity or community, I've taken a different look at politics and engaging in this system uh, since my experience at Guantanamo. And I got more active and I got more engaged. And I told about how I got thoroughly engaged, even at a national level. And then look what happened. Very disappointed in with, with regard to this issue of Guantanamo. But I see, for example, politics and elected officials and these leaders in this way. It's not that I trust them when they're in that position. But I believe that your community should force their hand to respond to your issues and to respond to your concerns and to act in the way you want them to. But how do you do that? I know in, in America, you do that by sending a signal to that elected official that if that individual does not respond to your concerns or responds to your community or act in a way that you want them to, they will know that the next time they're up for re-election, they will not be there. But that can only happen if the community mobilizes and becomes, on a massive level, part of the system to ensure that happens. In America, the Muslim community is not there. They they've elected officials virtually discard what Muslim concerns are. It's become a litmus test in one party to bash Muslims because it's popular. Right? But there are other communities in America who have taken this system and have really become effective at utilizing it for their advantage because they use their money, they use their resources, they get together, they're unified, and elected officials know that other communities 
If they don't respond to them, they will not be elected the next time around. So in terms of trusting what they, you know, in terms of trusting their leadership, no, I believe now, in terms of politics and the government in the United States, that no, not that you trust them, but as a citizen, as a community, you have the ability to use and engage the system to push them in the direction that you want them to push, you want the, in, in terms of the way you want them to respond. And that's something that I hope to, to develop in the United States with Muslims, to get them mobilized, to get them more engaged. And, and I'm, at this time, uh, working with many others in, in, in the community to advocate for Muslim participation in the political process. Because in my view, what I see is the only way that we can affect change and force these elected officials to do what we would like them to do is if they know that we have the ability, we are empowered as a community to ensure that they will not be leaders uh, if they don't respond. Okay, yeah. A brother's asking it, but it's from a sister. Has your experience in Guantanamo made you a better Muslim? Um, has my has the experience in Guantanamo made one a better Muslim? Made me a better Muslim? Uh, that's not for me to judge. I don't judge whether, I, whether I'm a better Muslim or not. Allah judges that. In terms of my iman, I can tell you, my iman has gone up and down. And as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe that iman goes up and down with your actions and your ability to do actions good or bad. In Guantanamo, you can't do that many actions except habsi khalwa, as I Ibn Taymiyyah said, that my, my um, imprisonment is my time for meditation with Allah. So in that sense, you can do a lot of meditation with Allah. A lot of, uh, for example, I can tell you that probably 90% of the Guantanamo prisoners uh, have all memorized the entire Quran. And so these are amazing things people can do, but of course you can't give zakat, you can't give charity, you can't struggle in Allah's path, you can't do all sorts of things there. But what you can do is limit it to your surroundings. After my release, there are things, as I said, have, have helped to raise my iman and make me feel better, and sometimes when it's completely low, very, very low. And that's the nature of iman. Mm -hmm. I will say also the same. Since my experience with Guantanamo and also being in prison, that since that time, my iman also has gone up and down. Uh, what I will say, though, the time that I was in prison, and it wasn't years, it wasn't months, many, several months like prisoners in Guantanamo or elsewhere, but it was 76 days. But I can say that during those 76 days, uh, my, my iman got stronger and stronger and stronger. After my experience in Guantanamo, there were times when I said to my wife, you know, I wish I was back in that prison cell. <laughs> because there was nothing to worry about except trying to get out, and others were working on that. And making my salah, reading Quran, making dhikr, that's it. So my, my iman during that time was very strong. Right? And of course, that would very much upset my wife. And she's like, what do you mean? You, you know, <laughs> well, I have no family when you were, you know. But, but she didn't understand my perspective. But since that time, yeah, my iman has gone up and down. So again, in terms of uh, whether or not that experience made me a better Muslim, again, it's not for either one of us to judge. But I also will say that my experience in Guantanamo certainly set me on a path down which I had never planned for. My intentions were totally different. I had expected to be a career military service member, serve the U.S. military as a chaplain and whatnot. Uh, but my experience certainly put me on a, on a different path that I had never expected. Uh, but we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of all planners. This question is, uh, what can we do for the brothers back in Guantanamo? Well, first of all, you know, it's gaining knowledge. Uh, you know, the Prophet said, Talib al-ilm fariditan ala kulli muslim. Uh, one Muslim uh, in another hadith that seeking knowledge is obligatory on every, on every Muslim. Uh, that is in relation to general principles of Islam, but it is also narrated by the Prophet ﷺ, who said, Whoever wakes up in the morning is not concerned with the affairs of the Ummah, he's not from amongst them. And so I believe that it's an intrinsic part of our belief in gaining knowledge in relation to that which concerns us, and what concerns us should be those 
who are less fortunate than us. And that includes those in Guantanamo and elsewhere. One of the things that I did when I returned from Guantanamo is that I, I, I started visiting the website of Cage Prisoners. And after that, uh, I became a member of it and then a director of the organization. It's one that campaigns for people detained without charge or trial around the world. Um, the brother mentioned, you know, you had the campaign for Babar Ahmed. Babar Ahmed, uh, I went to see him in prison actually just on, on Sunday. And his example is one of not Guantanamo far away, but Guantanamo right here at home. And the wing, the prison wing he's in, in the detainee unit in Long Latin, which is about 30 miles away from here, contains in it men who have been held without charge or trial right in the UK for, in one case, oh, for 12 years, an Egyptian, who now, after the revolution, all he wants to do is go back to Egypt. And there are other brothers there held with him on deportation orders or extradition orders. No, people who've never been charged with a crime over here, essentially the same with Babur, never been charged with a crime over here. So those are the sorts of cases we fight for. And then, of course, up the scale, there are places and like in Guantanamo, Bagram, the secret detention sites, uh, and proxy detention sites. These, these are the sinister places where America sent some people, and these places included Egypt and Libya, which now, alhamdulillah, have been liberated, but where they captured people and said, oh, we're not going to torture you. We're going to send you back to your country, and they know how to torture properly. Syria was one of those places. Several people were sent to Syria, including a, a, a brother called Mahar Arar, who was tortured inside a coffin for 10 months. Uh, uh, he's a Canadian uh, Syrian. So when people sometimes think, oh, there was no cooperation between uh, uh, Syria and the West, it's untrue. When it comes to these matters, astaghfirullah al that they are a one nation when it comes to this matter. And uh, so they sent people all over the world to these torture chambers. So. Uh, Part of our work has been investigating, going around the world, meeting with people, trying to change, um, raise awareness, change positions, getting countries to accept Guantanamo prisoners who can't go back to their countries for fear of torture. And all of this sort of stuff is extremely important. So inshallah, if you can visit the web website of cageprisons.com, there you can see the types of things that we ask people, volunteers, to get involved with, help to raise awareness, help to raise finance, come and intern in our office, uh, do research projects on programs that affect Muslims all around the world uh, and others. We also engage with other non-Muslim communities who've suffered under these types of uh, measures, like the Irish, for example. I've met many former Irish prisoners who were tortured and beaten and held without charge or trial who are very sympathetic with us. So learning from their experiences too.